On May 6th, 1957, the most watched television show in the United States came to an end. Throughout 180 episodes and six seasons, I Love Lucy had forged the template for the modern American sitcom. Starring the husband-wife team of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz as a hapless married couple, the program paved the way for a new era in television production in a country that had long favored the movie theater. In addition to making Lucy and Desi millionaires and temporarily saving their marriage, I Love Lucy left within Desi Arnaz a hunger to continue revolutionizing the entertainment industry under the banner of Desilu Productions. In the years preceding, Arnaz popularized the three camera sitcom setup, conceived the idea to shoot I Love Lucy on high quality 35 millimeter film instead of primitive and cheap looking videotape and would indirectly invent the concept of residuals and reruns as a result. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Desi Arnaz. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. We welcome you to Desi Lu Playhouse. As you know, this is film, and that's why you see all these cameras down here, and the boom, and the lights, and all the people, and all the stuff, because it's just like making a movie, see? Arnaz was determined to prove himself an actor and producer. My favorite redhead, the... Uh, the Vice President of Desilu Productions, Incorporated. I am the President. And sidestepped the assumption that he was merely the comedic foil playing second fiddle to Lucy. Desi Arnaz was a Cuban-American whose tenacious personality had been created in his brief but opulent upbringing in Cuba. The son of a Santiago mayor, and the grandson of an executive at Bacardi Rum, Desi's gilded childhood wasn't to last. Desi's family became political refugees following the Cuban Revolution of 1933. Here are the actual scenes of mobs running wild in Havana, celebrating Machado's downfall. Pathé cameramen made these exclusive pictures at the risk of their lives, as rioting crowds surged through the streets, shouting for the blood of Machado and his henchmen. Their home was burned, his father was briefly imprisoned, and the family later fled to Miami. Arnez went from living on a palatial estate to cleaning bird cages in just a few months. Over several years, Arnez learned English and cultivated his performing chops with a touring band and eventually auditioned for a Broadway musical, which was later turned into a motion picture when Arnez was 23 years old. And that motion picture starred Lucille Ball. This is the preview of a new band. A preview that carries the prediction of even greater achievement for its leader, Desi Arnaz. After successfully mastering two careers, leading man of the New York stage and star of the screen, Desi has now embarked upon his third venture. And we're confident that in a very short time, you'll be hearing a lot more about Desi Arnaz and his orchestra. Their fierce and passionate romance began almost immediately, laying the groundwork for the eventual rise of I Love Lucy and television history would be made. This is Tom Gilbert, a journalist and author of Desi Lou, the story of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Innately, Desi had excellent taste, and you know, he had been, you know, was used to you know, having refined things in his life, and I think that, that that translated to when he became a producer, he he, just, he was very good with talent. He appreciated talent. And I think he wanted to be associated with, you know, the, the top of Hollywood. And I, and I also think that he didn't want to be pigeonholed into comedy. You know, he was also battling stereotypes about, you know, Latinos. And he definitely wanted to gain the respect that I think, you know, highbrow drama would bring to him. And, you know, that's what I think drove him. In the film industry, Hollywood studios like Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, and MGM dominated the film production world, and television was largely seen as the lesser medium. Thanks to the ongoing production of I Love Lucy, Desilu Productions had emerged as one of the few independent production companies in the country. 
After I Love Lucy, Arnaz was ready to kick things into high gear. To keep pace with Hollywood, Desi's first move was to buy the recently bankrupted RKO Studios. Well, when Desi Lu sold the rights to the I Love Lucy show, or to CBS, they had some extra money, and they immediately put it into buying RKO Studios. So they, they needed to make money. You know, they took a big gamble on buying this huge you know, it was three lots. It was, you know, there was the Gower lot, the Coanga lot, and the Culver City lot. There was a lot of soundstage space. So they had to get those stages working. Well, that she is, Mr. Haven. That's the little Gower. Didn't that used to be your KO? That's right, Mr. Haven. Now, what do you say we swing over to Desi Luke Culver? Which includes our huge back lot known as 40 Acres for obvious reasons. You would call it 40 acres because it is 40 acres. <laughs> right now we're building a whole village down there, a whole western town. That looks enormous. Well, to give you an idea how big it is, that's where they may gun with the wind. You know, one thing is sure, you're not going to be cramped with space. First order of business was to get rental people in there to pay rent to use the stages while they tried to develop other shows. Owning 33 sound stages greatly expanded Desilu's production capabilities, but it didn't guarantee success. Arnez needed intellectual properties, shows, a series. He needed a hook. There's a better way to rent movies. As many as you want for only $17.99 a month and no late fees. To understand how disruptive Desilu was to become, it can be viewed as the Netflix of its day an upstart production entity that made its money initially from existing properties. Netflix. All the movies you want, only $17.99 a month and no late fees. But to grow, Desilu, like Netflix, needed to create its own films and television shows to become a competitive force. And Desi wanted to give the competition a run for its money. To do this, Desilu created the Desilu Playhouse. Sponsored by Westinghouse, the Playhouse focused largely on the occasional continuation of the antics from I Love Lucy, but was also meant to launch serious dramatic stories, telling a new story each week. The variety format was on its way out, but Desi, ever the producer, knew good material when he saw it. His first win was a science fiction fantasy script that had been shelved in the vault at CBS named The Time Element. Its writer had been penning screenplays for years but unable to get his own unique brand of drama off the ground. The writer, Rod Serling. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Westin House Desilu Playhouse. Tonight, we're gonna see a story written by Rod Serling and starring William Bendix. Our story begins in a doctor's office. A patient is sitting there. He walked into this office nine minutes ago. The time element about a man stuck in a dream where he's trying to warn about the impending attack on Pearl Harbor struck a nerve and became one of the most highly rated episodes of the Playhouse. CBS received over 60,000 letters of praise. Thanks to Desi Arnaz, Rod Serling would finally get the chance to turn his own brand of storytelling into a series a year later. The series? You've probably heard of it. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Six shows into the first season of The Playhouse, Desi can only briefly breathe a sigh of relief. The Playhouse was struggling for three reasons. Its intended purpose, to launch new television shows that Desi could produce, failed more often than not to welcome enough guest stars and capture enough prolonged audience interest. And after years of conflict behind the scenes, Lucy and Desi's marriage was on its last legs too. As the second season of The Playhouse approached, Desi needed another hit badly. Eleven days after I Love Lucy wrapped in 1957, an obscure printing company executive named Elliot Ness died in Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. Ness had been recently working with sports writer Oscar Fraley 
on an autobiographical account of his career as a treasury agent in Chicago during Prohibition and his efforts to harass the criminal empire of gangster Al Capone. Ness had been approving the final drafts when he collapsed from a heart attack in his kitchen. His book was called The Untouchables. Later that same year, The Untouchables was published and picked up as an option by Warner Brothers producer Ray Stark. There was some interest at Warner Brothers in being able to turn their large library of gangster drama stock footage into a television show, but the option languished. A year later, while attempting to drown his fears and occupy his mind on vacation near the Del Mar racetrack outside San Diego, Desi Arnaz received a summary of The Untouchables from Desi Lu story editor Lois Green. The material immediately resonated with the desperate Arnaz. Bells began ringing. After snapping up Warner Brothers' lapsed option, the first challenge in bringing to life the story of Elliot Ness and Al Capone was that Desi Arnaz had gone to school with Capone's son. Hoping the shelf life of Ness's book would be short-lived, the Capone family had their first taste of Hollywood in the release of a Rod Steiger film called Al Capone. The idea that the Capone name would be plastered over movie houses and now on television was not warmly received. Arnaz attempted to appeal to the younger Capone, saying that he would handle his father's memory with restraint. But the phone call between them ended disastrously. This is the true shocking story of Scarface Al Capone, who stalked out of Chicago to take America by the throat. He turned an American metropolis into a bullet-scarred battleground. Anybody gives you any trouble, anybody gives you back talk, you tell them, come see Al. They gotta see Al Capone. Nevertheless, Arnaz knew he had a unique opportunity and threw himself into production. With variety shows like the Desilu Playhouse falling fast out of favor among television audiences, Arnaz needed the Untouchables to be big. To convince Desilu's boardroom to fund the project, Arnaz pitched the film as not only a Playhouse production and a potential series, but as a theatrical B-movie that could warrant further return on investment in the future. With $400,000 budgeted for the period drama, Arnaz gathered his creative forces. Paul Monash, a television screenwriter, Quinn Martin, an occasional producer for The Playhouse and husband to I Love Lucy writer Madeline Pugh, and director Phil Carlson. Carlson, who had witnessed a gangland assassination attempt and helped police locate a brewery in Chicago in his childhood, had already carved out a name as the toughest director in film noir. Hey, Tony, I know a sure cure for a nosebleed. A cold knife in the middle of the back. Desi pushed Moe Nash to make the script more potent powerful enough to knock the couches out from under sedated audiences who had been lulled into a semi-comatose state by otherwise endless, uninspired fare. To Desi, this was no ordinary cops and robbers story. If Desi Liu's struggling television empire was to compete with Hollywood, let alone survive, it had to come on like gangbusters. Quinn Martin wasn't won over by the original script, but agreed to produce after further persuasion from Arnaz who positioned The Untouchables as a springboard for the 37-year-old's career. Martin eventually agreed, and decided if it was to be the smash hit that Desi intended, he would throw his creative weight behind it too. Throughout Culver City and greater Los Angeles, the wheels of the Desilu machine began to turn. Lynn Stallmaster casting poured over headshots to populate the story with characteristic faces. Transportation chief Aaron Dom went about finding the period correct vehicles. Carlson tapped his own reserves too, and brought on actor Neville Brand to play Al Capone. In short order, Brand was dispatched to Italian accent school, where he spent more time getting his dialect coach drunk than rehearsing his own Italian. Without an audition, actress Patricia Crowley would be cast as Elliot Ness's wife, Betty Anderson. But the script was still an issue for the creative trio. It needed an element that could tie together the proceedings and hammer home its real-life gravitas. What the script needed was a narrator. It's time, America. Time for Walter Winchell of the New York Daily Mirror and the Washington Post. Mr. and Mrs. North of South America, all the ships at sea, let's go to press. New York City. The big city is in a good mood again now that the 11-day newspaper strike is an unpleasant memory. Nobody won that one. The real losers, ladies and gentlemen, were the many war veterans and blind news dealers on the corner. They have no union to pay them juicy strike salaries. Despite having one foot on the accelerator towards obscurity, Walter Winchell was brought on to add an air of authenticity to the proceedings. 
As with Capone, Desilu had a history with Winchell too. Are you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I believe I have the right to be confronted with any evidence which supports this question. I should like to see what you have. Oh, well, you would. Yes. Well, you will pretty soon. <laughs> The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? In years previous, Winchell had insinuated that a certain red-headed television star was indeed a red-handed communist. The glaring spotlight of the red craze had reached a fever pitch in Hollywood, and the accusation was not taken lightly. Winchell had forced Lucy to publicly admit she was not a communist. Because of this, Lucy protested, but Desi knew that Winchell had been the voice of Depression-era America and after a Desilu-produced television show starring Walter Winchell faltered in 1957, Arnaz snapped up the washed-up journalist for his final hurrah. The genetic material for television's first made-for-TV movie, and in effect its first docudrama, were being gathered. But the untouchables still lacked a critical component, an actor to play the lead role of Elliot Ness. In typical Hollywood fashion, negotiations for the lead role were complicated from the start. Desi originally pitched well-known actor Van Heflin, much to the dismay of Carlson and Monash. Despite Oscar-winning experience portraying grizzled characters, Van Heflin didn't feel he was up for it. And as production was delayed, he left the project. Seeming to work in alphabetical order, Desi pivoted next to actor Van Johnson. Van Johnson's wife and manager knew the clock was ticking, and insisted he be paid $10,000 for the pleasure. But Desi, soured by the extortion attempt, passed. And Capone was set to take over Chicago the first thing Monday. Desi even briefly considered playing the role himself. Growing desperate, Desi ran through name actors of the day that he felt could meet the material. Cliff Robertson, Jack Lord, and Robert Stack. Having been John Wayne's co-star in 1954's The High and the Mighty, and recently nominated for an Oscar for his performance in Written on the Wind, something about Stack stuck. Arnaz immediately tracked down Stack and his wife Rosemarie on a date and begged them over a restaurant telephone to consider the role. Arnaz had the script immediately sent to Stack's home, but Stack wasn't impressed. It was television, and he was a film actor and Stack was still sensitive over the loss of his Oscar after years of toiling in B-movie fare. And the last pilot he'd performed in was so bad that Stack purchased the prints to guarantee that they'd never see the light of day. Arnaz pressed on and sweetened the deal. $10,000 up front, $7,500 if the show went to series, and 15% of Desilu stock. Stack still said no. He called his agent to share the bewildering experience and how it sounded like a ridiculous proposition. His agent fell promptly in love. Stack finally relented and said he would take the role just to prove how dumb he thought the whole idea was. There was no contract signed. Arnaz was betting the future of Desilu on a handshake. And as far as the world was concerned, when Stack arrived on set Monday, it would be 1929. What the hell? When Stack appeared at Desi Lewis Gower Studios, the wardrobe department presented a suit tailored to Van Johnson. Despite the ill-fitting suit, Stack grew at ease and found his character in rehearsals as the day wore on. Stack already knew how to handle a gun, but had little time to consider how to approach the character. As the script continued to undergo last-minute rewrites, Stack settled for simplicity. He would underplay the character with a strange, often silent, piercing presence. In a script full of violent and colorful characters, Elliot Ness would be a man of few words, totally in control of himself. And just beneath the surface, near periscope depth, would swim a composite of the three bravest men Stack had ever known. A stuntman named William Carey Lofton, who would later be called the Muhammad Ali of stuntmen for his work on Duel, The French Connection, and Bullet. Former Navy roommate Buck Mazza, who was one of the Navy's most decorated aviators. And Audie Murphy, who had become the most decorated soldier in World War II. Here's Robert Stack describing an experience with Audie Murphy that would simmer behind the portrayal of the man who took on Al Capone's criminal empire. A short story about Audie, for instance, was in Japan once, I remember. He's a little bitty guy. He won the Congressional Medal. You know, he's the sure. most decorated soldier in the history of the Army. This big drunk came in and was throwing his weight around. And Audie just looked at him and he said, get out. This drunk looked at him, and he could see about 22 dead Germans behind the eyes. And the weird thing is, he just 
turned around and went out. And that was what I tried to bring, a measure of the fact that this was a counterpuncher, that, that there was a threat behind him, and he was a very courageous, and a, they all had something in common. They just, they never talked about what they did. They just plain did. Sometime that afternoon, Elliot Ness was born. And with his help, Desi Arnaz was about to set off a chain of events that would rattle the countryside and change television history again. On our next episode, The Untouchables becomes a smash hit for Desi Lu, and the stage is set for a new series that will win awards and acclaim and become America's first televised culture shock. Join us at theuntouchablespodcast.com for weekly episode reviews and a behind the scenes look at the making of Desi Lu's The Untouchables. While you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast. Join us as we revisit and celebrate The Untouchables. And that, Mr. and Mrs. 48, winds up another edition over 400 ABC stations until next Sunday night or next week at the very same time. This is Walter Winchell, who disagrees with Adlai Stevenson's statement that the four fears have replaced the four freedoms. America, Mr. Stevenson, has more Minutemen than Boogeymen. Good night.